Welcome to the NFL Target Percentage Ownership Report for Week One. I'm Jason Gilbo at Gilbo Eleven. With me is Ricky Sanders at R Sanders DFS. Uh, welcome aboard. I'm in mean, your first pod with us, and I'm pretty sure you're stoked for uh, Week One here. Yeah, I'm excited to make my debut. Let's put it that way. I think uh, hopefully I can compete with Todd Gurley's season last year uh, here at Daily Fantasy Cafe. I can only uh, hope to break a long one every once in a while. I mean, that'd be huge. I mean, hey, you got a cupcake matchup then for week one because, I mean, he's your first guy that you talk about against the 49ers. Yeah, yeah. I I mean, it's a Chip Kelly-led 49ers team, which makes me like it even more. I mean, if you remember last year, that their defense was on the field for most of the time. And now we're talking about Todd Gurley, who's obviously going to be the focus of the offense. And while they may be keying in on him, I just think he's going to have so much opportunity in this game. And we're talking about for cash games, I think – uh, you know, especially because, you know, the influx of new players in the earlier weeks, look at him as, as one of the top players when, you know, if you've been playing the PPR format for a while, I, I think you, me, maybe most prefer those those top receivers that we know can get those 9, 10 catches on a weekly basis. But that being said, I don't think Gurley's overpriced or anything like that. I think uh, if you can find some of those mid-tier wide receivers that are you know, that you like as a value that you could go girly, uh, who's, you know, costs you significantly less than the likes of Julio Jones and things like that. And for that reason, I think he's going to be uh, heavily owned in cash games. I do think he's going to put up a solid performance. And uh, I think uh, he's worth considering. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. I mean, and obviously you talk about your projected touches over 20. I'm definitely in agreement. I mean, really hard to argue against that, against the Signers team that Game flow, I mean, it all just kind of sets up perfectly for him to dominate. And in terms of, of paying up, I'm all about the running back there with, with Gurley. Um, second here, I mean, you talk about Mark Ingram and Latavius Murray in, in terms of two options within that same game. Um, and I think a lot of us are going to be gravitating towards that, that Raiders-Saints game. Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to decide where I want to go with that game. I think for cash games, I'm pretty locked and loaded with Murray, who I think I've got projected at 20 targets. I mean, the news over the last – pretty much 48 hours has been all good for uh, Murray as a guy who's not really in love with his talent. You know, a guy four yards to carry last year with a pretty solid offensive line. It's only gotten better. Uh, I kind of thought that DeAndre Washington's probably the better talent in this backfield. But with that being said, uh, you know, early on against a cupcake matchup, I think you got to like Latavius Murray for a, a hefty amount of carries. And now the reports seem to think that he's going to get the same workload as last year. Uh, if he can average more than four yards of carry because they've pretty much filled the hole on the offensive line. I mean, uh, Jamarcus Webb, one of the worst players in the, in the league. I mean, I dealt with him as a Bears fan for a while. Uh, he's shipped off. They brought in Kalechi Azamele, who's basically a Pro Bowl caliber guard. So now that offensive line went from good to ridiculous, uh, probably the best in football. So running behind them against a little bit of an improved Saints defense, getting most of the touches. Uh, I think, you know, he's the safest bet on that offense, even though I really like that whole Raiders team. And I think because of the price difference with Mark Ingram, he's going to be heavily, more heavily owned, uh, and he probably should be. Yeah, I definitely agree. I mean, you look at the price difference, it's about a thousand, a little over a thousand, depending on what site you, you look at. And I mean, you talk about Ingram here, and, and I, I mean, you obviously touch on the targets that he gets. I mean, kind of an overlooked stat for, for Ingram in terms of working in the passing game as well. So I think kind of think on a site like DraftKings, that, that helps him out a little bit. Yeah, he, he was his receptions were solidified last year, let's put it that way. I mean, he went from a guy who was pretty much taken off the field every time Darren Sproles would come on uh, when he was in there to – them basically never utilizing C.J. Spiller, who was supposed to be that guy. So he kind of became the workhorse. It doesn't look like there's any reason to think uh, that's going to change. So, you know, I have him as an elite play for that reason. If I had the salary to spend up on him, I would. But, you know, my initial lineup, I'm looking at it. It just doesn't look like it's going to work. Yeah, yeah, definitely a little bit pricier. And I think in terms of the other running backs, they're probably going to be overlooked and a little bit undervalued in terms of ownership. Um, next one here, you talk about Spencer Ware. Obviously, this one going to be a popular one. It won't be the first time you probably talk about him. It won't be the last time you talk about him. Um, what do you like about him the most here? Well, let me put it this way. I think I'm going to fade him in tournaments as it is. I think he's going to be so popular. He's going to be one of those cheaper guys that everyone's going to be on him. And unless he has, uh, you know, a 100 yard and a touchdown game, uh, you're really not going to regret not using him if it comes to tournaments. But but in cash games, I think he's going to be so heavily owned, and we're talking about a guy that's, you know, without Jamal Charles, probably going to 
come close to 20 touches in a system that's conducive to the running back. Uh, he may catch a few, and he's definitely going to get the goal line carries. So, you know, for that price tag, I think it's 4400 on DraftKings. I mean, how do you pass there? Uh, for cash when you can make so much else work along with it. Uh, you know, we're always looking for those value guys. And if you can get a, a workhorse back for that price, I think he's he's worth it. Uh, so don't get uh, too cute there. Yeah, I definitely agree. I mean, in the matchup here against the Chargers, I mean, you stated allowed a hefty 4.8 yards per carry last season. So it's <laughs> everything kind of sets up pretty well for him. Uh, in terms of, of kind of a GPP move, I mean, you go into a, a Browns offense here with Duke Johnson, and, and I like this play quite a bit. I mean, um, I think there's certainly a lot of upside here. Yeah, and uh, I was on a podcast the other day with a guy who said that, you know, historically uh, – running backs who rely on receptions don't do well with, with quarterbacks who run. But I'm not convinced that RG3, after all these injuries, is going to be a guy that's going to be comfortable taking off and running a lot. I think we might see him in the pocket more than people think. Uh, and therefore, I mean, we're talking about a guy who caught 61 passes last year, an Eagles defense that was pretty conducive to receiving backs, and an offense, an Eagles offense that's really not that good. So I think uh, the Browns may be on the field more than you think. I think all their options are way underpriced. I mean, you look at them, uh, they're probably the cheapest offense out there in terms of everything. And I mean, without Josh Gordon, they probably should be. But in terms of, you know, this defense it's one of the better ones they're going to get and I think it could be faster paced than people think uh, I know all the reports recently have been that Isaiah Crowell is going to be their workhorse and they want to run the ball but don't forget earlier in this camp they were saying you know how Duke Johnson's going to be a weapon and so I think uh, you know on DraftKings and sites with PPR I really love those receiving backs and all it takes for them in tournaments is to catch one in the open field and go. And I certainly think he has a chance for that. And at the same time, I certainly think he has a chance for five, six, seven receptions. So uh, there's both a floor there, I think, uh, you know, assuming that this, this running quarterback trend doesn't hold true. And I think there's upside, too. Yeah, definitely agree. I mean, at 5,100 on DraftKings, I mean, and you talk about him, I mean, projected ownership, you have him about 5 to 10%. Pretty low in comparison to that, pretty much everyone in the table here that you have. So I, I like that in terms of a GPP move, and I'm, I'm with you. I think the Browns are underpriced, um, especially going up against an Eagles defense that really, I mean, we're not too sure what to expect from them. I mean, they could be one of the ones to target again. Right. Uh, looking at wide receivers now, obviously Julio Jones. I mean, obviously you have a couple of those tier one guys that you always like to talk about. I mean, why Jones here in terms of comparison to guys like Brown or or um, Odell Beckham? Huh? Well, Brown has got Josh Norman, so I see a little bit of downside there. Do I still think he's going to have a good game? Yes, but am I as sure of it as I am with Julio Jones? No. Uh, you mentioned Odell Beckham. There's another guy who they kind of schemed against him last year where they would have a safety over the top. They ended up having two quiet games against them. And people are going to blame that to, uh, you know, uh, on variants or something like that. But I think if you watch those games, they were really focused on him. Uh, it's a reason that I, I don't have him in the, in the chart, but I really like Sher Sterling Shepard and GPPs because I think uh, they are going to focus on Beckham again. So when it comes to the top guys, I mean, Julio Jones against a defense that really was, was mediocre against the pass last year. I think they allowed 31 passing touchdowns he's their red zone target uh he's probably going to rack up the targets again he led the league last year led the league in receptions so i think he's the safest of that upper echelon tier but even with that being said and i think he's going to be the highest ownership uh deandre hopkins is the guy that i prefer yeah definitely i mean in transitioning into hopkins i mean i feel like he's just not getting enough buzz for i mean what he did last year and, and it was funny because i mean in one of the quarterback articles we talked about uh, Hopkins and all the all the uh, quarterbacks that he played with. I mean, T.J. Yates. I mean, obviously Brian Hoyer. He, you know, I don't think it's any different when uh, Osweiler is coming in here to, you know, just get him the ball in terms of ten targets and, and kind of forcing it to him. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to garbage throwing to you, does it really matter what that garbage is? I mean, it, it garbage in, garbage out kind of thing here. And if you look at the table, I've got them projected the highest score, and that's mostly because, I mean, we're looking at a Bears team without their top three corners, and that's pretty much confirmed. Uh, we're not, like, waiting for Sunday for a questionable tag or anything like that. They're just not going to play. Uh, so I think you have to consider Osweiler, even though I don't love him, you have to consider him an upgrade. And if you look at this Bears secondary, that's just going to be completely depleted. Uh, it's hard to imagine they wouldn't devise a, at least part of a game plan to get him 
the ball early and often. I know his targets faded in the second half last year, but again, we were talking about some of the worst quarterbacks maybe to ever step on a football field versus Brock Osweiler, who should be a bit better. Uh, so I think that, that DeAndre Hopkins is a true wide receiver one, and if they look at this secondary and they don't game plan for him, then I don't even understand football anymore. <laughs> I agree. And I mean, in looking at the prices, I mean, is a slight discount from some of those top options as well. And in fantasy drafts, I know, I mean, $1,100 difference from Julio Jones. So, I mean, a little bit of a price savings there with Hopkins. Right, exactly. I mean, that definitely comes into the play as you can, you know, spend up slightly elsewhere uh, that, you, that you see warranted. I mean, we'll get to the bet or we'll get to uh, the tight ends where I like to, to spend up. Uh, there's just a lot of ways you can go if you if you save the money from some of the top guys to him. And again, he's my highest projected performer. Uh, next one, you talk about Sammy Watkins. I mean, pretty reasonable price tag here for week one. Um, I, I like those prices a lot. I think he's going to be uh, quietly owned, and, and you put here about 5 to 10%, uh, right around 10 targets. You have him at 9. I mean, uh, decent matchup as well. Yeah, I mean, you look at Pro Football Focus's rating, uh, Jimmy Smith, who was a first-rounder. Uh, I don't know if people really look at him and are scared of him. He rated his Pro Football Focus's 76th corner last year. He's also a little banged up. Uh, so, I mean, you look down the stretch last year, and Sammy Watkins was just a monster uh, in his final. I think it was six games. He had at least 19.2 fantasy points in those, didn't dip, dip below 13.4, and I think the number was 25 fantasy points is what he averaged uh, during that stretch. Somewhere around there it was between 24 and 25. So he developed into a true wide receiver one. The pricing algorithm isn't really giving him that credit. Uh, I think most analysts really aren't giving him that credit. But when you're looking at a roster and it's, should I spend up, you know, maybe to get a Jordan Reed uh, if I go down from Julio Jones to Watkins or should I, you know, save a tight end? I think Watkins can be expected to put together a monster performance like that. If you look at how he ended last season and just uh, the situation hasn't changed. Tyrod Taylor still loves him. Uh I know he's not like a six five monster like some of the other receivers, but the production's there, so so I believe it. Yeah, I'm definitely agreeing. Sixty nine hundred on drafting, seventy three hundred on Fanduel, thirteen k on fantasy draft. I mean, um, in in terms of who you got here in, in this table, I mean, really a mid price in comparison to guys like Jones, like Hopkins, uh, and even some other names. So. Uh, I like him quite a bit. Uh, I like that kind of stack there with, with Tyrod Taylor. I think there is some some upside. Yeah, I agree with you. You can get that rushing from Taylor and the receiving from Watkins. Yeah. And uh, looking at value here, I mean, two guys in the same game. You talk about Marvin Jones, Dante Moncrief. Both these guys I like a lot. Um, and that Marvin Jones price on, on DraftKings at 4600 I, I can't imagine people are going to overlook that and not play him a ton. Yeah, I think he's going to be one of the highest uh, ownership players. The question is uh, – is he still worth it? I mean, it, he is because he's so cheap. But now without Vontae Davis there, you know, that was kind of my worry with Golden Tate. Uh, I think for tournaments, he just uh, pretty much firmly entered my radar. But let's just talk cash games only. I think Jones is going to see enough tar targets. Uh, he's one of the red zone targets. Eric Ebron's kind of uh, dinged up right now. And I know Tate got a lot inside the 10 last year, but Jones is kind of a bigger guy. Uh, he's kind of your prototypical one. He scored double-digit touchdowns before. So in a, you know, the highest over under the day, uh, a receiver you can get for this cheap, definitely going to warrant some ownership. And one that, you know, you got to start three receivers on DraftKings. I think you just set it and forget it kind of thing. I forgot what commercial that's from, from the 90s, but uh, you could do the same with him. And then when it comes to Moncrief, uh, that one's kind of got me, uh, you know, a little messed up too because Hilton's got the better individual matchup when you look at the cornerback matches. But I kind of look at Moncrief as the guy who was Luck's guy uh, when they were healthy together. I mean, this is a guy who scored in five of the seven games. He scored, I think it was 0.7 touchdowns a game with Luck. So Moncrief is the guy I think it can, can develop into a true wide receiver one. You look at their implied total, it's the highest of the day. So, you know, kind of like a, a game in Coors for baseball. You, you want to see if you can get at least a little exposure to it in cash games just so you know uh, if they do go nuts, you at least have a chance. Yeah, definitely. And kind of unlike, you know, the, the Coors reference, you're not paying up a ton here for Moncrief. I mean, decent price. Right. I mean, a little bit of a swerve off T.Y. Hilton. Um, and, and as you mentioned, I mean, the implied totals for, for the Colts is, is the highest on the board there. Um, and, and you got to like them. Jumping into tight ends here, um, you're looking at Jordan Reed as your top option. And obviously, I'm in agreement. I mean, he's still cheaper than Gronk. Uh, Gronk's obviously a tough matchup here. Jordan Reed's kind of that clear-cut number one. 
Yeah, and I kind of want to uh, throw it out there and, and pretty much scream it from the mountaintops that on fantasy draft specifically, his price is absolutely ridiculous. You know, usually when you look, uh, fantasy draft pricing tends to be uh, in line with DraftKings in a lot of spaces. Uh, two two prices that stand out to me this week are D'Angelo Williams, who's basically a five thousand dollar player on DraftKings. He's listed at seven thousand there, uh, and Jordan Reed should be in the thirteen thousands, and he's barely over ten thousand on fantasy draft. So if you're looking for cash game guys, and really, I think. 10-3 for Jordan Reed, pretty much locks him into my tight end spot in just about every format. I mean, this is a guy uh, facing a defense that allowed the third most passing yards. They gave it up to the tight ends, and he can score 100 and a touchdown anytime he steps on the field and pretty much has uh, since the end of last year. So this is my true tight end one. Uh, I like him better than Gronkowski and Ross score. He's cheaper, so what's not to like? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we've already highlighted on quite a few value options as well. So I think it's safe to kind of pay up for a tight end spot. You don't necessarily need to look into value, but you obviously do talk about some value guys here. Kobe Fleener, obviously coming into New Orleans with Drew Brees. Uh, definitely kind of a lot of buzz going there um, and at a cheaper price. But as you mentioned here, you're not really buying him in cash. You're, you're more just suiting him for a GPP play. Yeah, I think he's going to come at a higher ownership than I'm comfortable with for a guy that uh, has struggled to catch the football since he came in. I mean, people are assuming that the situation is going to get better, but really what? how is he going to get better than uh, his college quarterback at one of his friends with, with Indianapolis? I know they had Dwayne Allen there, but he still struggled. He never developed in that true tight end one. I think people are expecting that. Uh, going to play it that way because his, his price is so much cheaper than Gronkowski and Reed. And I'm willing to, you know, garner a share of him or two, but I'm not really willing to go heavy on him, especially with the likes of Jordan Reed and some guys that I, I think are better. Maybe even his old teammate, Dwayne Allen, uh, are better for, for a cheaper price. So he's kind of one of those mid-tier guys I'm a little torn on. I understand the case for him. I just don't buy it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, and that's something that you can get a good swerve off of if Fleener is highly owned. You give some other options to kind of pivot to. Uh, Delaney Walker, obviously another another tight end here who was kind of Mariota's safety blanket last year. Great guy for, for PPR sites like DraftKings uh, and still kind of reasonably priced as well. Yeah, I think he's the uh, – I wrote about it in other places. I'm not sure I wrote it in this article, so let me just say it. Uh, for cash games, there's really only two tight ends that I feel comfortable with. On Fantasy Draft, it's Jordan Reed in pretty much every format. On DraftKings, in order to fit other things, such as you know going up from a, a low-end receiver to Sammy Watkins, I'm willing to drop down to Delaney Walker uh, because he was last year's leader uh, in receptions at the tight end position. I know everyone's excited about Tajay Sharp. I know Rashard Matthews is in town, but uh, I mean, you look at these uh, these matchups, and in terms of DVOA, the Vikings rank 25th against tight ends and pretty much above average against both receivers. So these are still two reasonably unproven receivers, especially in Sharp, and we look at the matchups from last year. I still think Xavier Rhodes is a good corner. Um, I think they pretty much have a pair of good corners. So, you know, there's going to be a learning curve for those guys. There's not going to be one for Delaney Walker. I still think he, he's the leader in, in targets, and I think he produces enough uh, for cash games. Whereas, you know, when you look at some of these lower guys, I like them a lot, and I'm willing to take them for their, their salary, but not if I'm trying to finish top half in a 50-50 because I do think there's a little bit of, uh, you know, goose egg potential with them. Yeah, I definitely agree. I mean, you talk about Dwayne Allen here, Clyde Walford, two cheap guys. I mean, um, both both guys with some potential. I mean, in situations where um, you kind of like what they have to offer, especially at that price, and, and obviously are in great matchups. I mean, you look at Walford, I mean, that New Orleans defense was just atrocious on pretty much all aspects last year. And for 3K, 4,700, 5,900 across the three sites, kind of hard to go wrong there with a the little punt option. Yeah, and his uh, his targets down the stretch last year catapulted, so that's why I like Walford. Uh, even the coaching staff is saying that they think he should be a big part of this offense from the start. So against that defense, they gave it up everywhere. I think Walford's one of those cheap guys who can you know, come up with 40, 50, and a touchdown for cheap, which is what you're looking for if you pay for him. And then Dwayne Allen, again, going back to that high total for Indy, 
Uh, you know, I don't love him as much as some other people do. I know people are going to look to get the Luck Hilton uh, and someone else stack in tournaments, and that's not really one that I think is absolutely necessary. I actually prefer the Lions and going with Matthew Stafford. But that being said, I do understand the Vegas line. I do understand that this should be a game where they go pass happy. And if I'm going to get a part of it, uh, you know, I'd rather spend – near minimum to roster their tight end who's now uh, getting all the targets with Kobe Fleet are gone than, you know, spending up for uh, T.Y. Hilton or, or Moncrief in a bit of a, a, a more difficult matchup where they need, uh, you know, a monster game to come through. You can you can get a decent performance from Allen and still be happy with it. Yeah, definitely agree. And, I mean, as you, as you mentioned here, really in Indianapolis, I mean, in, in terms of guys they rely on inside the, you know, the 20, um, it, it's Moncrief and Allen at this point. I mean, Hilton's not really a red zone guy. Uh, who knows how that rushing attack is going to be. Offensive line really isn't that great. Frank Gore is up, obviously up there. So I like Allen as a great kind of low-end TD target there. Yeah, I agree with you. That's that's got to be the allure of him. Um, he scored eight touchdowns in 2014, which was Andrew Luck's breakout year. So, if you believe in the breakout that uh, you know last year was due to injury or or a down year or whatever it is, and you think he's about to bounce back, uh, you know the Lions defense is a prime candidate for him to bounce back. And Allen was his guy in the red zone that that year. So, so why wouldn't he be again? Yeah, definitely. Anyone that you felt like kind of missed the cut here? I mean, that you wanted to get in who just didn't kind of quite fit. Yeah, there's a lot of names that uh, you know that I've been looking at. I think Kirk Cousins at the uh, because we didn't you know go quarterbacks uh, kind of got left out. Dak Prescott because of the, the no quarterback ash issue. But I mentioned Sterling Sharp, who's kind of one of my uh, tournament guys because I do believe that Odell Beckham uh, was shut down for a reason. Uh, I think I pretty much hit all the tight ends in terms of running backs. How about Darren Sproles uh, as a cheaper guy against the Cleveland defense that really does not have much to offer? They've said that uh, he's going to be pretty much a staple in their passing game. And, uh, you know, this is a guy who scored at least seven touchdowns on three of the last five years. Uh, he's got a young quarterback who's going to be, you know, looking for those security blankets. So I really like him. And the same goes for Zach Ertz. I like those security blankets for the Eagles just because uh, this Browns defense is so bad. If Wentz has got anything in the tank at this point, uh, those guys should get theirs. Yeah, those are definitely good calls right there. So uh, pay attention. Check out Ricky's article here on Daily Fantasy Cafe. That's going to wrap things up with the target and ownership report for week one.